But uh, to keep us mostly on schedule, I'm uh, happy to invite Dr. Randy Vida to the virtual platform to present Accessing the Data, Query, Reporting and Examples. Thanks, Randy. Hi, I'm Randy Vida. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, some of what Alex talked about, but in more detail. And um, hopefully it will be enough detail to lead you on your way to doing your own queries. So I'm going to talk about how you query the data, um, how we present it to you, and I'm going to go through an example that was provided by a user in the past. Next. There we go. Okay, so this is the homepage of the IDB, and it has these six main uh, search panes, and 99% of the queries done on the IDB can be done right from this homepage. And I'm going to walk through each of these in a little bit more detail and show you some of their features. So the first one at the top of the page is the epitope itself. It's whether you're interested in linear epitopes, discontinuous epitopes, or non-peptidic. And many people who come to the IDB already have a peptide sequence that they're interested in that you can type into this box. But I want to really encourage you to use this drop down next to it that lets you search for substrings in various blast match identities, because different authors may have done all their research on a slightly different peptide. It could be a little bit longer, it could be a little bit shorter than your peptide, or it could have one or two amino acids different, especially with the viruses that are really variable. So um, it's a good idea to go really broad to start with, like do the 70% blast option and see how much data there is. There could be a lot of data for an epitope that's you know, one amino acid longer than yours, and you don't want to miss that. And then the next search box is the epitope source. So if that epitope was natural, what organism did it come from and what antigen? And for the organism search box, you can just start typing. And because we use NCBI taxonomy, like um, Alex mentioned, we have all the all of the synonyms from NCBI, which includes common names. You can use, you know, you could type cat instead of having to type out the uh, proper taxonomic name for cat. But um, also when you start typing, the shortest best hit will come up first and you don't have to type out the whole word. So if you don't know how to spell the end of the word, don't worry about it, just start typing and then you'll get um, the choices for which we have data. There are can be organisms for which no one's published any epitopes and therefore we won't have that data. But if it's been published, um, we will have it. And it changes every week when we add new data to the database. And then the next part of that epitope source search box is the antigen. So for most of the epitopes, this will be a protein. For a small number of the epitopes, this could be a larger non-peptidic molecule like LPS. But because so many species have proteins with the same names, typing out the protein name is uh, kind of uh, perilous. You're going to get a lot of hits, and you may not see the hit that you're interested in. So it's better, I encourage you to just use the organism first, and then I'll show you on a subsequent slide how easy it is to, once you have all the proteins from one organism, you can very quickly narrow to just a single protein if you're interested in just one of the epitopes. If you're only interested in epitopes from one protein. So the next search box is a host. This is whose immune response is being measured. Um, was it a human? Was it a mouse? Was it non-human primate? Or any other species that's been published? If there was an immune, adaptive immune response studied in any vertebrate and published in PubMed, we will have that data. And um, you can, for all of the search boxes, you can type, as I was saying in, in the shorthand common names like dog or camel, um, or you can click on the find button that you'll see in, in many of these boxes. And the find buttons opens these browsers. These tree browsers, um, they're based on a taxonomic hierarchy for organisms, and they're based on ontology um, hierarchies for um, some of the other search boxes. So here you can see um, all of the vertebrates, and you can browse through if you're curious um, what sort of data hosts we have data for. You can quickly get an idea. And then the next search box up at the top on the right hand side is the assay. So these are the experiment types that we have data for. So either T cell, B cell, or MHC ligand assays. And you can um, do really broad searches if you want to eliminate um, B or T or MHC, you just uncheck them. If you leave them all checked, you'll get all the data, all the assay types. And there's plenty of epitopes that are studied in multiple assay types, TB and MHC. 
And then the default for the IDB is always we give you positive assays only, but we do have the negative data as mentioned before. The negative data helps you see what's been done and found to be negative or what context an epitope is negative in. So it may be positive in an allergic subject, but negative in a healthy subject who's not allergic. So that might be interesting to you. And so um, just like the others, you can type if you know the name of the assay. But um, if for assays, it's easier to click the find button and look at the tree and browse through it because you might want to search on a higher level. You might want to look at all 3D structure assays or all biological activity assays, um, regardless of the method used. Um, so look through the tree and see what assay types are most relevant to you or take them all and then browse through the data. And the next search pane on the homepage is the MHC restriction. So this is relevant to T cell assays and MHC assays. Um, and you can do a broad level search for class one, class two, or non-classical if you want to see all of that data, or if you want a very precise MHC restriction, you can type it out. But MHC nomenclature um, is pretty complicated with dashes, asterisks, and colons. And we use the proper MHC uh, nomenclature um, from the experts um, via the MHC restriction ontology, which is what the find opens up a tree view of that ontology structure that lets you search in high levels. For example, you could search all cattle class one or all BOLA one or a very precise allele. And it, this all comes down to what the authors provide. Some authors give very precise restriction and others give more vague. And all together, it gives you a picture of what's known about an epitope. And then the last search pane is the disease. So this is the disease of the host at the time of the experiment that was relevant to that adaptive immune response. And again, you can do a really broad search on all infectious, allergic, autoimmune disease, or if you have a specific name of a disease, you can type it. And this find button opens up a hierarchy, and this, and this is the disease ontology. And so it organizes all of the diseases for which we have data so far um, in a tree structure, allowing you to search on high levels, like all animal models of disease or all uh, neoplasms. Or you can click open the branches and pick specific things, like if you're only interested in drug allergies or metal allergies. So there's all sorts of ways to browse, either very specific or more broad. Also, clicking through the trees gives you an idea of what sort of data we have. So then last, I want to go through um, how to use the search interface using an example from a user. And then they had asked, um, how can you see the difference between B and T cell responses for a pathogen? And so um, any pathogen, it doesn't matter um, what it is, you would search for it the same way. And um, one of the users that asked about animal pathogens, um, yes, we do have, and if the data has been published, um, you can just type in the animal pathogen name just the same as a human pathogen name. And the example I chose was influenza because there's so much data for the influenza. It's so widely studied and continues to be. So you go to the epitope source box and you start touching, typing the pathogen name. And whether it's Plasmodium falciparum or a bacteria or a virus, you type it in and I use the autocomplete and I see influenza A showing up right there and I'm going to pick it. Um, once you've picked it, it shows a one because I picked one organism name. But many of these fields are multi-select and you can build your query picking more than one. I could also add influenza B, B virus if I wanted to and then it would show a two here. And our search interface doesn't know when you've completed building your query, because I might want to now limit only to linear epitopes, or I might want to li limit only T cell data or class one, or, you know, you can add as many or as few of the search parameters as are relevant to you. And then when you're done, you have to hit the search at the bottom of the page once you've completed all the parameters you want to add. And once you've done the search, you'll have the opportunity to add or remove any of those search parameters, as I'll show you next. So when you hit search, you're taken to the results page. And on the results page, the search parameters you have applied are at the top, and the ability to add more is on the side panels and then built into the display also. So up at the top of the pending filters on the side panel where you can add more uh, search parameters, we have a relatively new filter options uh, drop down, And this was added because we have different types of users. Um, you know, we have infectious disease users and allergy users, but we also have T cell, B cell, and MHC specific scientists interested in the IDB. And they want sort of different things from the IDB. And in order to give you more uh, narrow search features, we added these uh, filter options that change what search inter inter what the search interface looks like 
um, once you click it. So because my query was really broad, just influenza A epitopes, I landed on the default results page. And in the result, uh, default results page, you get a few um, added search features that are not on the home page. So I'll show you those first. So in the epitope search box, which is similar to what you saw before, now we've added the ability to search for all assays where there's a 3D structure, because we do have 3D um, uh, structure data from the PDB where we, you can click out and see that 3D structure. Um, then we also added the search box for amino acid modification. Many um, users are interested if one of the amino acids in the epitope was mod post-translationally modified, and this drop-down gives you um, the types of PTMs we've encountered. And then in the epitope source box, which has the organism and a like the homepage, we also have the ability to add uh, related structures. So these are analogs, mimetopes, and neoepitopes. So for example, my query was for influenza A epitopes. So that would be all epitopes from influenza A, but there could be analogs of influenza A epitopes that are not natural. So they're not from influenza A, but they're very, very similar. So they may only have one or two amino acids different. And that for me, that could be interesting to me also. So if you click that checkbox, that data would be also included. And then also, Compared to the homepage, we have two new search boxes that didn't fit on the homepage because they're not um, searched as frequently, and we don't want to make the homepage too complicated. So we add the receptor search box. So the IDB does capture TCR and antibody sequences, and you can search on them, either the whole link sequence or just CDR123 or the B domain or whatever type of information you're interested in. There's a variety of checkboxes and drop downs. And if you have sequence of CDR3, you can um, enter it and see if we have any epitopes for it. And the reference search box, so all of our data comes from a reference, either a journal article or a submission. And you can narrow your results by author or title or dates if you just want to see the most recent data. And then if you have a specific PubMed ID, you can also put that in. So next, if I had chosen the T cell filter option, it would change the search panes to give me T cell specific. Um, search parameters. So when you're searching the receptor box, I'm now only searching TCR data and TCR alpha beta chains. In the assay search box, I'm only searching um, assays relevant to T cells. And I've added the feature that you can now look for direct ex vivo detection. So this means that when the T cells were assayed, there was no um, re stimulation in vitro prior to that experiment. And some of our users wanted that additional information. And then in the MHC restriction search box, we added two features, one the resolution and one the evidence. And the resolution is how well defined is the restriction. And this is, again, dependent on what the authors give us, but some authors will tell you this is a CD4 epitope. So all we know is that it's class level restriction. But another author may determine um, the beta MHC uh, class two chain. And so they'll tell you this is a, a um, DRB 101 epitope. And so we'll have just that one chain. And another author may test, you know, binding for all sorts of combinations, and they will define exactly the two chains, um, all four digits of the allele. And some of our users want to narrow their data to only see the really well-defined MHC uh, restriction. And then for the evidence, it's this is how we came to know that restriction. So some authors may uh, do tetramer assays. So there's a single MHC present. And so if the epitope bound to the tetramer, then we know it has the restriction by that method. Or they may have done MHC binding prediction um, to determine the restriction. So we let you know that, that there was no experimental methods proven the restriction. So you can decide for yourself um, how stringent you want to be about the restriction, um, both at the resolution and the evidence level. And then next, if you pick the filter option for B cell, you get antibody specific uh, search parameters. So the receptor search box is now searching only antibody sequences. So it's searching heavy and light chains. And the assay box is only searching um, antibody assays, B cell assays. So you can see things like neutralization. And we also add the ability to narrow your results by assay type. So if you only want IgE data or only IgA data, you can do that here. And then the last filter option that we have is MHC. So we have both MHC binding and MHC ligand illusion assays, and you can decide between them or you can look for a specific assay in the finder. And in the restriction box, 
we again, just like with T-cell, we have resolution and evidence. Only here, the evidence is relevant to MHC-like and elution assays, things like what, what antibody was used to elute the MHC, so how well defined was that restriction. And the next back out to what the result page looks like. So here's all the filter options over on the left. And the first tab that you land on when you do a query is the epitope tab. And we have each of our data presented to you on a separate tab, antigens, assays, receptors, references. And each tab has different headers uh, based on what's relevant to that tab. And they're structured all very similarly. They all have a header row that you can sort, the little arrows, and they all have um, similar features. So on each of the tabs where there's an ID column, it comes first and that ID column takes you to a details page. So this epitope will have a details page and Bjorn mentioned this when he was talking about the MHC restriction of an epitope. And uh, because I chose influenza, there's a lot of data from my example. So this first epitope, when I click on this ID, I get this details page about the epitope. And at the top, there's a summary of what's known about it. And that same epitope may be from different proteins and organisms. In this case, it's matrix protein influenza A virus. And it tells you how many times it's been studied, what papers, what 3D structures we have. But here you can see all of the MHC restrictions for which we have data or MHC alleles for which there was data, because sometimes it's negative. And if it was only negative once, then you can kind of take that with a grain of salt. But if it was negative many, many times, you can kind of assume that MHC does not present that epitope. But being 77 times positive out of 77 experiments, you can pretty much conclude it's an AO21 experiment. And then here, when you see the 10 out of 10 for A2, that gives you a little bit of an idea about what we mean by that resolution and evidence. So some of the authors just told us A2 restriction. They didn't go further to say the AO201 versus AO206, for example. And then below the, the MHC information, we have antibody assays, if there are any, and this epitope has both B cell and T cell assays, but it has way more T cell assays because it's a very highly well-established T cell epitope. And as you can see, there's a lot of indifferent uh, gamma release assays, and it's very positive in that regard, but there's very little data down here on IL-12 release, so it may not be as relevant, but it's also not very well studied. So this gives you an overview of what's known about the epitope to date. And again, when we add new data each week, these numbers may change. And then next, back out to the epitope tab on the result page, I wanted to point out these inline filters. So anytime you see one of these little funnels with the plus sign, you can narrow results immediately on the fly to that variable. So if I wanted to limit to only see data for this epitope, I would hit this funnel. And if I only want to see data for matrix protein one, I hit this funnel. And that's how you can narrow very quickly to specific protein from a particular organism. And then next we have the exports. Alex also mentioned that, and Kelly is going to talk about the exports in more detail. But there's a number of formats, and there's a lot of details about how you can do the exports. And I'm going to leave that to Kelly. And then the next tab over from epitopes is the antigen. So this is a source of the epitope, and most of the time it's protein. Um, in this case, the first one here is hemagglutinin, which has a lot of data. And again, this is the headers. And when you click on the uh, writing, the text for the antigens, you get a new feature, which is this um, antigen summary page. So there'll be a summary of all of the information we have about epitopes from that protein. It's been tested in lots of different species. Lots of different vertebrates, ducks, and European polecat, <laughs> cows and llamas. And then just there's a lot of data on it. That's why I chose it as a sample. But I wanted to point out that we also link out to other resources. And those links will be at the bottom of the page. In this case, there's an example about looking at um, all of the post-translational modifications in IPTMNet for this protein. And then the next tab over from the antigens is assays. And this is where the real bulk of the IDB and our data lives. And I really encourage you to export from these tabs because you'll get a lot of rich information about what's been curated. What you see here on the screen is just a brief summary. We've sort of concatenated some fields and made it all fit in a quick view. But when you look at the details, which I'll show you, and when you export, you get all the fields that we've curated and there's all sorts of stuff, insights and additional data in there. And so because my query was for all assay types, I have some data on each of the assay type tabs because this epitope is really well studied. There's a lot of um, experiments. So looking at each sub-tab, here's the T-cell assay tab. And again, it has the headers that are sortable and inline 
filters, and then it has the ID column. And then the ID column is what takes you to the details. So when you click on the ID column, you get the assay details. And regardless of the assay type, they always this page starts the same. It opens up in a new page. And the top of the page is about where that data came from. We always want to point back to where we curated this from. We didn't make up the data. We took it from this PubMed ID. And then the next section will always be about the epitope because every assay belongs to an epitope. It was testing the adaptive immune response to that epitope. In this case, it's a T cell experiment. So this is a T cell um, context for this epitope. And we link out to other resources. And we tell you where in the paper we got the sequence from. This is the materials methods. And then the next section will be about the immunization, um, whether the uh, host species had a disease or was injected with something, was vaccinated, um, we'll have that information if that led to that adaptive immune response. In this case, it was a mouse injected with the epitope, but it could be a human who had a disease. Then the next section is the assay itself, what type of assay this was. This is a treated thymidine proliferation assay that was testing uh, lymph node cells for both the effector and the antigen-presenting cells. But whatever the context is, we'll have those details here, and we'll link out to external ontologies to give you more information about each of them. And then lastly, because it's a T-cell assay, we do have some MHC restriction information. And in this case, it's only to the class level because that's what the authors gave us. It was a Bob C mouse, so that's how we know it's H2D. And in this case, the assay antigen was the epitope. But we um, curate all contexts where the immunogen or antigen could be an organism. It could be the whole protein. You could take an epitope-specific T-cell line and test proliferation to a protein or to um, other epitopes, um, maybe cross-reactivity. So we capture all the different contexts. So that's what you get when you look at the details. What was the immunogen and the antigen in each of the contexts? And then we tell you where in the paper this came from. So this proliferation assay was in figure two. And then uh, back out to the results page. Next to the assay tab is the receptor tab, and this is the BCR and TCR sequences, if we have them. And certainly some epitopes have a lot more data than others. And in this case, just like with the other tabs, there's an ID column to start with. And when you click on that ID column, you get a details page about that particular receptor. And so for each receptor, we give you all the detail for which we know. In this case, we have CDR3 um, alpha, with the alpha chain and the beta chain. Sometimes we only have one or the other. And you can see here how in different publications, some provided CDR1, 2, 3, and some provided um, only CDR3. So the different publications provide different levels of information. We take all of it, whatever we have, we'll put it in there so you can see. And then also you can see how the same um, receptor are bound to several different epitopes. So they all look like probably analogs of the same epitope. That would be my guess. Maybe some could be natural variants. But we'll give you whatever compiled information we've gathered from all the different publications. And occasionally we'll get a receptor that bind, that cross-reacts across species. The, the very last tab of the results page is the references. So this is where the data came from. And just like the others, it has the sortable headers, the funnels. It has a link out. Um, you can go to that PubMed ID by clicking on the leave the page icon. And then you can click on the details um, in that first ID column. But I want to go back to what my query um, was trying to achieve. And that's looking at the difference between B, cell, B and T cell responses for a pathogen in my example, influenza. So when you look at the assays tab, you can see right away um, how many T cell assays are and how many B cell assays are, and you can export these and analyze them any way you would like. Um, you can also narrow your um, query right from the start to either B or T just by unchecking or checking these boxes, either on the home page or on the results page. So when I redo that and I only do T cell epitopes because I've taken off the B and MHC, I see 2,200 um, epitopes that have a T cell response um, for this pathogen. And then similarly, by doing B cell assays only, by unchecking T and MHC, I can see that there's 1,400 B cell epitopes for this pathogen. And then next is another way um, to really see the differences between responses, and that's using our immunome browser. And so when you're on the antigens tab, each protein will have this little graph icon next to it, and that graph icon takes you to the immunome browser. And there'll be a um, help 
topic there when you first go to the page so you can look at it and it really helps you visualize um, differences and it's totally based on what your query is so if my query was p cell data versus t cell data for the same protein you can see the responses plotted along the length of the protein starting with amino acid one to the end and you can see where the peaks are and you can do the same for a cd4 t cell query versus cd8 t cell query and see the plot um, showing you data in different places. If there's a region of the protein where there's uh, no data, then you know it hasn't been studied. If there's a region that's on the red line, then you know it was studied and always negative. And any query you do, you can compare the results. So you could do a Bobsy mouse and Black Six mouse and see how they're different. Or you could do a subject with diabetes and a subject that was healthy um, for the same protein. Uh, and then lastly, I just wanted to point out that the IDB is a core trust seal repository and there's a little icon at the bottom of the page that tells you that and this just lets you know that the idb is um, trustworthy and there were um, a lot of uh, work and application to show how we were trustworthy and you can read about that here and you, if you click on the icon at the bottom of the idb page it'll take you to the information and the details about how we became trust officially trustworthy it just lets you know that you um, can count on us. <laughs>